Uh, for those of you watching and listening, again, thank you for being here. If you're watching this later on or hearing this message, I hope that you will be blessed by today's message. The best way to know more about our church is by visiting our website. And here again is our website address. It's fvccelp.com. And there you're going to find all the information you need about our church. Um, again, here's a screenshot about what the website will look like. There on the top left corner, top right hand corner, you're going to see a menu. And there you will find uh, many uh, of the pages in our website, our statement of faith, our vision statement, a little bit about, if you want to know a little bit about myself, my family, how I got here, how this church came to be, um, it's all there. Also, um, we have a media page there, and, and on this page there, you can access our audio files and our video files on YouTube. Um, again, you can find those on, you be able to listen to iTunes podcast, SoundCloud, and also on YouTube. We have a uh, YouTube channel on uh, Oh, a page there so you can look at our old videos even the videos we've had back in the hotel but uh but yeah that's where you'll find our media files so again um for those of us here um if you haven't yet filled one of these out um these are the white uh these white cards are in the back it just uh informational cards a little tell us a little bit about yourself um uh, if you're visiting you i just want to thank you for for coming, send you a thank you card for coming. But in the back, it's probably one of the most important parts of this card because it's your prayer requests and your praise reports. If you have any prayer or have a prayer request, anything you want us to pray about, you can fill this out, drop it in the back. You can put it there. You can put your name on it or you can leave it anonymously, but we'll definitely be praying for you, whatever you have written on this card. Um, and... Yes, we, we definitely will not forget about you. For those of you watching, again, if you go to our website, that card also you'll be able to find a, a version of it on our website. There you can fill out this portion out, and it'll come to me, and um, I will receive it. I will be praying for you, and, and I will respond to you uh, as soon as I can if, if you want me to. Um, again, very simple. You just fill out this information here, press send, and... It'll come straight to me. Um, again, also, here at the church, we don't have a formal offering, or we don't pass the bag around or a basket around. We want you to give out of the joy of your heart, whatever it is you want to give, whether it's a penny or a million dollars, it's up to you. We don't want you to, you know, we, we, you know it's, we want you to give joyfully, happily. You know, we're not going to be back there checking to see what you, what you give. So um, we have a box in the back where you drop off those cards. You can put whatever it is you want on there. Um, and, you know, again, it's between you and the Lord. You can also give online um, on our website. Again, in the site menu, you can go there, uh, and it will direct you to this page. Or you can go to the bottom of the main page. You can find this also. You press this button there, and you can give via PayPal. Um, and it's very simple. It's not that hard. You can give a one-time uh, donation, or you can do a mo recurring monthly gift also if you wanted to. And we just recently, I don't have it up here yet, but we just recently added also if you wanted to give uh, cryptocurrency. We set up uh, a page up also. So if you wanted to give that way, um, you can give via Bitcoin, Ethereum, you know, uh, Cardano, any kind of, you know, the options there. You have many options to give via cryptocurrency. Again, I think you can do that anonymously if you wanted to. Um, but again, it's up to you. Again, no, no obligation. I uh, want you to give out a joy of your heart. I um, just want to remind you also that on the 24th, we're going to have a Christmas Eve service. Um, it's going to be from 6 to 8, I believe. And uh, it's going to be a short Christmas message uh, if you want to. Invite a friend, a family member. We'll be sharing the gospel as well. So, um, if you know anyone that wants to, that needs to hear that message, uh, please bring them. You know, a lot of times, a lot of people come only twice during the year for church, and that's Easter and Christmas. So, um, this is one of those times where, again, they miss, this may be one of the only opportunities they will hear the gospel in the next year or two. So, um, please invite them if you can. 
And I think you'll, be you'll, you'll enjoy the message as well. For those of you watching, we are going to be live streaming this as well. Um, just a couple of reminders. Um, this upcoming, we do have a weekly men's Bible study here on Wednesday given by Pastor Isaac. Um, it's Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m., but I think this Wednesday uh, we have postponed it. We have can not can well, it's just postponed for this Wednesday coming up. Um, but if you have any questions, please email the church. I think Isaac's email is also on the website, I believe. Um, but again, contact us. We'll give you more information about, I think it's going to resume the following week. So again, it's, uh, but just, just to let you know, this Wednesday will be counts. But we do have this men's Bible study every week. Um, also, we do have a youth ministry here. They meet right after worship here, right after, usually I'm done with the announcements. Pastor Isaac takes them to the back um, room, one of the rooms back there, and he has a, a Bible study ready for them that they can uh, all kind of interact or be a part of and enjoy um, with, I think Isaac has, does a great job teaching uh, to the young men and women out there. So um, please bring them if you, you know, uh, if you don't, if you think that there's no room for them here in the church, there is. There is, absolutely is. Don't let that be an obstacle. Same thing with children's ministry. Um, we do have a children's ministry. Um, you can bring them, bring your children, and we have a place for them here as well. Um, and that way you can come and sit for a couple hours and, and hear the word of God. But yes, we do. It's right after, again, right after... Uh, uh, the message or the uh, announcements, announcements here. Today we have uh, a special message from a special guest. Um, I have known Pastor Mike for many, many years and his wife for many years. We did youth ministry together over at Calvary Sun City. He now is pastoring a church over in the east side called Calvary Chapel Redeeming Grace. Um, and he is an amazing, great pastor. I've Heard him teach many, many times, and he's definitely gifted. Um, he's he's a great friend, a great brother. I love him very, very much, um, and he's definitely blessed me and my family in many, many ways. The more I talk about him, the more I just want to get start getting choked up. But um, <laughs> he's a great guy. So, so again, I want to just ask Mike to please come up and deliver the message. You have to thank you, Mike. I appreciate it for coming up. Let me give you these mics here. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning to those of you online as well. Thank you all for giving me the opportunity to come and share. And uh, I, I really hope that you, you don't have too high of an expectation for me. Angel really talked me up. And, uh, you know, if I end up uh, less than what he proclaimed, it's just because he's super excited. <laughs> but um, what, let's go ahead and start off with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. And Lord, as, as we've gathered here to meet with you, to meet together as your body, Father, we just ask that you would draw close to us as your word promises, that if we draw close, that you would draw near to us, Father God. And so that's what we've come to do. Speak to us from your word. May it just be that transforming power that you've desired for it to be in our lives, Father God. Give us the strength and the courage through your spirit to adhere to it and to allow it to have that perfecting work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, this morning, if you guys would go ahead and take out your Bibles, we're going to be in Galatians chapter 4. And we're going to be looking at verses 4 through 6. And as I was thinking about what I was going to teach when Angel invited me to come and teach and I'm being a week away from Christmas. There was a lot of different topics. You can talk about the first Christmas. You can talk about the light of Christmas. You can talk about all these different things dealing around Christmas. And um, to give you a little information about me, here's how I handle the Christmas season. It doesn't start for me until the 24th. On the 24th, that's when I go to the store and I get everything that I need. The night of the 24th, I wrap everything, and on Christmas Day, my kids are surprised because nothing has happened all year long, and all of a sudden, something's there. <laughs> That's kind of the way I do it. So we're down to the last week of Christmas. We're looking around, right? We're watching people during Christmas. Um, you might see the same things that I do, in which there's a lot of hoopla 
that are revolves around one thing at Christmas, right? Presents, gifts. Everyone is on a mission to find that right, perfect gift, aren't we? It has to be just perfect because there, there's two categories that you can go into when you give a gift. Um, there's the one where it's like forever held, treasured, cherished, and loved. And then there's the other category where somebody else gets it the next year. It becomes a re-gift, something that remains hidden in their house until they know that you're coming over and then it's proudly displayed as if they had it out all year, right? And we, we want... We want to get somebody a gift that they're either going to use, love, cherish, or that it's going to bring some sort of joy. We don't just go out and we get, well, that's the first thing I saw at the store, and here's what you get, right? We, we put some thought into it, and we think about it. And um, the official Christmas shopping season starts in November, doesn't it? Uh, on Thanksgiving, usually. This year, it didn't. This year, a lot of stores stepped up and said, we're going to stop that, and we're going to start it on Friday once again, and they, and they promise that that's going to be the way that it's going to be, and we'll see. But during this time of the Christmas season, it is estimated that Americans spend an upward of $579 billion on Christmas gifts. The task of finding the perfect and the right gift is a task that time and time again proves to be difficult because you do it one year. But we never think, well, next year i got to do the same thing. And then the year after that, I got to do the same thing. How many perfect gifts can there be out there anyway? You have thinking, what could they use? What do they not have already? What size would fit them? What is, what's their style? Our loved ones, they're tight-lipped, right? Because you ask them, what would you like for Christmas? Well, you know, you know what I like. <laughs> Ladies, I'm going to let you know. Unless your husband is an excellent communicator... They don't know what you like. You got to let them know. <laughs> they don't know what's on your mind. You have to tell them. And because otherwise, here's what we're going to rely on. The commercials and the marketing schemes that tell us this is the perfect gift. Everybody needs one of these. And as opposed to our own desires, what we want um, and what we would like, they also cloud our ability to see what others want. A lot of times my wife ends up with gifts that I could really use. And that it usually is, I was like, I thought this would be so useful for you. And it's really something that's useful for me. So this morning, as we turn to Galatians 4, perhaps look at a new Christmas passage for you, maybe. Um, it's a Christmas passage, nonetheless. In, in Galatians 4, verses 4 through 6, we're going to turn there and we're going to see that Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, reveals that the perfect gift giver has given to us the perfect gifts already. He's given us several, and the gifts we received from him in heaven came on the very first Christmas when he sent his son, Jesus. He sent his son, Jesus, to be born of a woman laid in a manger, and his gifts are perfect because he knows perfectly well what our greatest needs are, or what our deepest desires of our hearts. You see, God doesn't rely on whimsical lists of the perfect gift and here's where you find those too hard to shop for. And he doesn't need the commercials to tell him what we could ever need or ever want. And so as we look to the end of this week where we're going to unwrap our Christmas gifts, let us this morning unwrap Christmas. And so starting in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, When the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. To redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And so if you're note takers, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you three perfect gifts that God gave us on that Christmas morning when he sent his son. The first gift is called what I would like to say the payment. The payment. See, at Christmas... What, we end up racking up a lot of bills. Sometimes it goes to credit, and then, and then the payment comes later, and we dread the payment. This is one of those payments that we love because it's already been made for us. To really understand how the first Christmas gift is payment, the importance that we need to look at is in that word in, chap in verse 5, where it says, When the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem that word redeem in the Greek is ex a gorazo. That's two words being put together. And one is uh, a gorazo, which means of pain, uh, out of 
trial, out of suffering, and the other one is X. And when you put it together, it means that you deliver, that you buy from, that you buy up, that you liberate or set free. The sense that it's used here is it's less about the actual redemption and it's more about the price paid. The actual price paid. It's impossible to separate the two concepts because it's talking about the whole idea of being set free by a payment of a price. And that's what happened when God sent Jesus to be born. Jesus was always born not just to be a baby in a manger, but to be our redeemer. He's the one who paid the price. And interesting enough, the price that he paid did not begin on the cross. It began before the cross because all through his life, he had to live the perfect life, the sinless life. In his entire life, he had to endure the unjust treatment, yet he remained without sin. I can't go one day with unjust treatment with remaining without sin. It's hard. And the more you go without sinning, the harder it is not to sin. The temptation grows. We only know temptation that grows to a point in which we give in. Christ knows the point of temptation to which you never give in to. And that temptation grows, straight, grows stronger. We know he was tempted. It says that we don't have a savior who doesn't understand what it's like to be us. But he was tempted in every way that we are, yet without sin. I don't want to undermine the price paid at the cross. It's indeed a significant price. But without the sinless life that he sacrificed, the cross would have been worthless. He would have just been another man dying on the cross. But by paying the price, he, Jesus, God's only son given to us, came to set us free or to redeem us. And in Titus chapter 2 verse 14, it says he gave himself for us. To redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession, eager to do good works. You see, this wasn't just a down payment in case we became worthy. This was a payment in full, though we definitely were unworthy. If you were in Christ Jesus here this morning, you were unworthy until Christ called you worthy. It's because of Christ that we became worthy. In Matthew 20, verse 28, it says, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And Paul writes again in Galatians 3, he says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Because it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. One of my favorite Bible commentators um, known as America's pastor and the pastor to all pastors, Warren Wiersbe, he says a man could purchase a slave in any Roman city. There were about 60 million slaves in the empire. And he could either keep the slave for himself or set him free. Jesus came to set us free. That's the great exchange of redemption. And it should give us the eyes to see the value that we have in the eyes of our creator. As I said before, we're worthless. We don't have value in and of ourselves. We cannot stand before God and say, look at how cool I am. Don't you just love? Because there's nothing of redeeming quality within ourselves. The Bible tells us that even our greatest deeds, even our most righteous deeds without Christ before God are like filthy rags. There's no single redeeming quality of us on our own. And I don't say that so that we can all be down on ourselves and, and, and hate ourselves. We have nothing that we can boast in or trade in. What I want us to see is that in the cross of Christ and the redemption that he purchased, we have become precious and priceless. Because the precious blood of Christ paid for your redemption, paid for my redemption. If you're here this morning in Christ Jesus. That same precious, priceless blood that paid for us is what transferred value to us. That's how we determine the value of something. It's it's determined by the price that is paid for it. And when God sent his one and only son to die on the cross for your sins, what God was saying is your redemption is worth the cost of my one and only son. 
In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, the apostle writes, he says, For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your ancestors. You were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. This reminds me of coupons. I don't know if we still have coupon clippers. I know that a lot of us get coupons in our email now, and sometimes we get them on our phone. And if you have the app for whatever store you're at, you can get your coupons that way. Um, but when they were printed, they in and of themselves, they have no value. They're printed, and they're worth less than one hundredth of a penny. It even says on that. It says the, the cost of this thing is one one hundredth of a penny. But when you take that coupon to the right store for the right product, it is exchanged for a valuable transference for a discount or something that's free. And in exchange, it becomes valuable to have. A.J. Gordon was the great Baptist pastor of the Clarendon Church in Boston, Massachusetts. It's okay if we don't know who he is. But the story that he tells... It says, one day he met a young boy in front of the sanctuary carrying a rusty cage with several birds fluttering nervously. Gordon inquired, he said, son, where did you get those birds? The boy replied, I trapped them out in the field. Well, what are you going to do with them? Well, I'm going to play with them, and I guess I'll just feed them to an old cat that we have at home. And Gordon offered to buy them, and the lad exclaimed, mister, you don't want them. They're just little old wild birds. They don't even sing very well. And Gordon says, I'll give you $2 for the cage and the birds. I think this was a while back because uh, I think $2 back then was a lot more. And so the boy says, okay, it's a deal, but you're making a bad bargain. The exchange was made. The boy went away. He was whistling and happy, and he had his brand new shiny uh, coins or dollars. And, and Gordon walked around to the back of the church property, and he opened the door of the small wire coop and let the struggling creatures soar into the blue sky. The next Sunday, he took the empty cage into the pulpit and used it as an illustration in his sermon about Christ coming to seek and save the lost, paying for them with his own precious blood. And as he shared the story, he said, this boy told me that these birds were not great songsters. But when I released them and they winged their way heavenward, it seemed to me that they were singing, redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. That's the story of Advent, of when Christ came. That's the message of these times that is sung in the same song as those wild birds. It's the song sung in every carol that you will sing this Christmas season. Redeemed. That's the meaning behind every gift wrapped and given under the Christmas tree. Redeemed. It's the word that the shepherds heard that cold night. Redeemed. It's the assurance that Mary received when she was told that she would carry the Savior of the world, redeemed. In the star that the wise men followed to go see the King of Kings who was born, redeemed. You and I have been trapped by sin, but here this morning that Christ has purchased our pardon, we have been redeemed. If you ever think that you aren't worth much, and if you ever think that you're cheap, just remember what God thinks of you. He thinks you're His, twice His. And tell another story. There's a boy, and this boy made himself a sailboat, he whittled it out of wood, made it, carved it, beautiful. Lots of detail to it. And he took it down to the river and he, he, he was letting it float downstream and it, it floated wonderfully. But suddenly a strong current came and it took it out to the middle of the stream where he could no longer reach it. And it started going downstream and he kept running after it as fast as he could to keep up with it. And, and eventually it got away from him and it went down and the rapids grew wilder and it kept going. And the boy stopped and he cried because he lost his boat. A couple weeks later, as he's in town and he's going through, he goes past a toy store. And right in the window of the toy store, he sees this boat. And he says, that's my boat. And he goes inside and he buys his boat. 
And as he's walking out, he says something very peculiar. He says, this is my boat. You're twice mine because first I made you, then I bought you. That's how Christ sees us. First, you're his because he made you. And second, you're his because he bought you on the cross, paying that price to redeem you. But there's more. He gave us another gift at Christmas. When Christ was born into this world and given to us, the second Christmas gift that we were given from God is the privilege. You see, God didn't just send his son to redeem us. No, he also sent him that we might receive adoption as sons and daughters. What a glorious privilege to be the sons and daughters of God. You see, Christ gives us the right, the legal authority to become children of God. In John 1.12, the, the apostle writes in his gospel, he says, To all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be the children of God, to those who believe in his name. How awesome it is that God did not just pay our penalty and leave us, right? He could have just paid our penalty and that would have been more than enough. He owes us nothing. But not only he redeemed us to what we were, but that he redeemed us that we would become so much more. No, he didn't leave us as we were. He welcomed us into his family, into the family of Christ. We are the children of God. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, it says, See what great love the Father has given us, that we should be called God's children. And we are. That Greek word for children denotes the same legal claim and status as a natural born child. It's the word used for an adopted child, but it has all the same qualities as that of a natural born child. We're born into the family of God. So why the adoption? It's confusing when we think about it in our Western culture, in our American modern Western culture. You see, it had a different meaning in the ancient Greco-Roman world. And in order for us to take a look and see that, we're going to look at that word adoption. And it's a long Greek word and it's pronounced weotheseia. And it's made up of two words. One is weos, which is a son. And the second word is thesis, a placing. There's no test after this on any of the Greek words. That's just for your benefit if you so desire. Um, it's a placing and it, signifi it signifies the place and condition of a son given to one whom it does naturally, not naturally belong. This word is used exclusively by the Apostle Paul. The expression literally in order that we might receive the adult son placing. In Greco-Roman culture, you could adopt a child, not your own, as your own. They would receive full rights. They would inherit. They could have wealth passed on to them. But the most important thing about adoption in those days is it did not matter the age of the child. The moment you adopted that child, they would be placed in as adult sons. We as believers are adopted into the family of God as fully mature adult children. Immediately. Brought into the inheritance in which we are an heir. And the instructions to Christians in the New Testament is assume no infancy among the saints. We are all treated as mature children in Christ. The moment you were born again, you assumed the position of an adopted son or daughter. You became heir to the riches of the father. And too often people say, I can't really be used by the Lord because I've only walked with him for one year or two years or even five years. Or I can't get involved in intercessory prayer because I'm just a new Christian. And I'm not, I'm not as mature as all the other Christians. And, and if that's you and if that's your heart, I just, the Lord wants to say that that's wrong. Concerning the privileges and responsibilities of the kingdom, you were adopted as a mature child and with as much right to be blessed and used by the Lord as Billy Graham was as anyone else. It does not mean, however, that we are equal to Jesus Christ. We are adopted sons, but God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We, we're all sons and daughters of Christ, but he only has one begotten son. There is no childhood period in the sphere of Christian responsibility. There is no matter how long you've been saved. 
You could have been saved yesterday and God can use you immediately. You do not have to wait and say, well, I must grow up first. No, God can use you immediately. Whatever God says to the old and established saint, he says to every believer, including those most recently regenerated. In human experience, legitimate birth and adoption never combine in the same person. There's no occasion for a father to adopt his own child. However, in the realm of divine adoption, every child born of God is adopted at the moment he is born. He's placed before God as a mature, responsible son, according to Lewis Berry Chafer in his Systematic Theology. The privilege. You were redeemed. You're given the privilege of adoption, meaning that God has you as a mature child from the moment he got you. And he can use you. And he wants to use you. He will use you every day of your life if you allow him to. But he also gave us a third gift. He gave us a wonderful third gift. And and, and this gift is precious when we understand its importance. And that gift is proof. He gave us proof. The third gift he has given us, it's not any less important than the others, but the proof that he's given us, you see, God has given us his spirit. We have the greatest gift that a father could give, the the spirit of his son in our hearts, known as the Holy Spirit. That's what it says in in, in, uh, verse 6 is that he has given us the spirit of his son. Known as the Holy Spirit. Salvation involves the full trinity of God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And as sons, we have the same nature as our Father. You see, when we trust Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live within us. And that means that we are partakers of the divine nature. If you take notes, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 Peter tells us that we are partakers of the divine nature. We have the nature of God dwelling in us. Now, some false pastors have gone and say that this means that we ourselves are God. We are not. But God does dwell within us. We do have the same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives in us. The law could not give us God's nature. You could follow the law perfectly until the day you die. You would never have the nature of God indwelling in you. That best, all it does is reveal our deepest need for the nature of God. But the Holy Spirit indwelling in us is the very proof, is the very seal of God's forgiveness, Christ's redemption, and our adoption. In fact, in Ephesians, Paul writes that we are sealed with his Holy Spirit. And that seal, it it, it signified something that was done. And and you could not break the seal. It it, it was sealed forever. And we are sealed in his Holy Spirit. In Romans 8, 9, it says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. The inverse of that is true. Everyone who has the Spirit of Christ belongs to him. Romans 8, 16, Paul says the spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. There's times where doubt is going to come in our life as Christians, right? There's going to be times where we're going to doubt, am I really God's? His spirit dwells in us and testifies to us that we are his. You know why? Because if we aren't God's children, we don't care if we offend God. We don't care if we're bothering God. We don't care if we're even living for God. But the spirit that lives within us helps us in that in which we, go, we, we have that sense of disappointment. We have that sense of guilt. We have that sense of shame when we dishonor our father. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit testifies and it provides for us a real closeness that's felt. It's a nearness to God. It's an intimacy with God. In fact, it says that the spirit cries out with our spirit and it teaches us to call him Abba, Father. Now that word Abba, that's an Aramaic word. And it's the equivalent of our our vernacular in which we say Papi or Daddy. It's a term of endearment of a child to his father. It's a closeness. It's an endearment. And the Spirit draws our heart to God with this familial closeness, with this familial intimacy. That instinctive cry 
of the heart Paul believes to be the work of the Holy Spirit. When our lives are hurting, when our hearts are hurting, and we cry out to our Father, we say Father. When we say Heavenly Father, we call Him Daddy. That's how we know that we're God's children. That's how we know that all the inheritance of grace that He's promised us is ours. The Holy Spirit is the sign and the pledge of our adoption. You see, by his presence in our hearts, we're truly convinced that God is for us and not against us. There's a lot of people that suffer because they refuse to accept the grace of God, which says, believe in my son and his name and you shall be saved. And they say, no, God would never save me because he doesn't know. You, you don't know what I've done. God would never want somebody like me. God would never... And that's a lie. And that comes from the pit of hell, from Satan himself, who desires that none of us would find that salvation that God promises. And that's why God sent his son. He said, I'm sending my son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God's not sitting around waiting to condemn us. The truth of the matter is his word reveals to us we're condemned already. But God said, I'm not leaving it there. I'm going to provide a way. I'm going to provide my own son as a sacrifice. You know when that promise was made? All the way back in the Bible in the Garden of Eden when man first sinned. And God provided a curse upon the ground and a curse upon the serpent. And he said that there, there would be a child born of a woman and he would bruise his heel, but he would crush the serpent's head. It was reiterated when God called Abraham and he said, Abraham, I want you to take your only son, the son whom you love. And I want you to go and offer him as a sacrifice. And so he gathers everything that he needs for the sacrifice. He takes Isaac and they go up to the top of the mountain. Even Isaac, he goes, hey, dad, we're all here. Everything's all ready, but where's this sacrifice? And as Abraham was ready to sacrifice his one and only son, God stopped him. And the word in the Old Testament says that the Lord would provide himself a sacrifice. That was the promise. And that's what he did when he sent Christ to be born of a woman, to be born as a, as a baby. He's not against us. He's for us. He loves us dearly. He's our heavenly father. And the first indicator of adoption is the new way we come before God of the universe. He's no longer God of the universe. He's no longer this far off, distant, aloof God. But he is our heavenly father that we can come to and we can call him daddy. We step into our mature adult uh, child position, our adult son, our adult daughter position. And the Holy Spirit gifts us to work within the nature of God and with the power of God and the gifts that he's given us. You, do you know that every believer in Christ Jesus has promised a gift of the Holy Spirit to be used in the body of Christ? That's the importance of church. Church is the gathering of the body together to work together, each in our own individual places and positions in the body. And all of us know how our body works together as a whole, right? There's no part of our body that we would wake up one day and be like, oh, I don't know where that part is. It's okay. I don't need it today. If we woke up without our arm, we'd be like, hey, wait a minute. There's something wrong here. It doesn't matter how small the body part is. You know, um, as, as you get older, it, not you, as I get older, there's different things that happen. You get uh, skin tags. You get different things like that, right? Have you ever tried to just like tear one of those things off? That hurts because a part of our body is necessary and needed and, and, and it's attached to us. That's the way that Christ sees his body. He is the head of the body and he wants the body gathered together. We have that privilege. We have that glorious privilege to come before and be used with the nature of God in the power of God, with the gifts of God. God's gift to us that gives us all those gifts is Jesus. And it meets our greatest need, right? If our greatest need had been information, God would not have sent us a savior. He would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, 
God would have sent us a scientist or an inventor. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us a, a banker or an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness for our sins. And so God sent us his son as a savior. You see, God sent us the one who redeems us. And in redeeming us, he gives us the ability, the right and the privilege to be adopted as sons. And then he indwells us with his very own spirit. Your body in Christ Jesus is the temple of the living God. Jesus was God's gift to us. And he's a gift because we didn't earn it. We couldn't earn it. We, we can't earn one second of the presence or the love or the sacrifice of God. He gave it as a gift. But like all gifts... All you can do is give it. It's on the other party to what? They have to receive it. They have to receive God's gifts. And the way that God told us to receive the gifts that he offers, the sacrifice of his son, the indwelling of his Holy Spirit, the adoption as children of God is by faith. It's through faith that we receive that gift. It comes through the faith in Jesus Christ as the son of God given to men for salvation. It's only by placing our faith in him and his name and his work on the cross and the truth of the resurrection that third day that these gifts can be ours. There's no other name given under heaven by which men must be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ for salvation. Father God, we come before you this morning, Lord, and we thank you so much, Lord, for opening our eyes to perhaps even a new Christmas passage for us. And Lord, as we look at the truths that are contained in, in these short verses, Father God, I pray that you would give us a richness, a newness as we enter and, and we come to the, the pinnacle of this Christmas season, Father God, that we would truly remember that Jesus is the reason for this season. Father, that we would remember that no matter what gifts we find underneath the Christmas tree, no matter what gifts we unwrap, maybe we don't even have gifts to unwrap, but Lord, you have still given us the gift of your son, and that comes with many other gifts related to it, Father God. Lord, I pray that you would help us to not only know that for ourselves, but that we would know it in such a way that we would desire to take that out and share it with those around us. That there is a greater gift, better than anything you can receive, better than anything that can be ordered on Amazon or bought in a store, better than anything we ourselves could make. It's the gift that Jesus Christ, God the Son, gave himself on a cross that we might be saved by believing in him. It's in his name that we pray, Father. Amen. Thank you very much for that beautiful message. Pastor Mike, I, you know, I, I was definitely blessed by it. I hope you were as well. But I want to take a moment to speak to those who are watching and listening to this message. Um, Pastor Mike spoke about our, well, the title of the mess, his message was Unwrapping Christmas. Well, you don't have to wait until Christmas to unwrap this gift that he was speaking about. You can do that today. So whether you're here today, or whether you're watching this live or listening to this or watching this later on, whether it's a week from now, a year from now, whenever it is, you can unwrap this gift today by coming to the cross and asking Jesus to forgive you of your sins. And so if you've never done that, if you've never, you know, if you're ready to be born again, you're ready to have a new life in Christ, to be adopted sons, to be adopted daughters, I want to lead you in a prayer to be born again. So again, wherever you're at, I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. 
and pray this. Lord Jesus, I come before you now and come to you as a sinner. I admit, Lord, that I've done wrong and I'm a sinner and nothing I've been able to do or will do will save me. But I believe that you died for my sins. And I confess that you are my Lord. I believe that you rose from the dead three days later. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. Pray that you will help me to live a life for you, to live a life of obedience, Lord, and I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born again life. Again, I accept your forgiveness and thank you so much for dying for me. I pray this in your name. Amen. If you prayed that, we definitely want you to reach out to us and let us know um, that you did. If you want, we want to maybe lead you in your next steps of your new Christian life. But just be, but know this: there are angels celebrating in heaven right now, having a big party. There's a big Christmas party up there in heaven right now for you, um, because a sinner has been redeemed and you are now born again. So again, reach out to us if you want us to send you a Bible or you want us to maybe help you find a church in your area. We can do that. If you're here in El Paso, we want to definitely invite you to come and check us out um, here on the corner of Gateway South and Hondo Pass. Um, you know, come as you are. You don't have to, you know, you can come just the way you are and we will accept you here. We will love you here. We will share the message of the gospel well, that share the gospel with you, and you know, just we want you to learn the Bible. Again, we're not promising a big, flashy show here, like big concert here, a motivational message. No, we're just going to teach you the Word of God. So again, thank you so much for joining us. I pray that you will join us. Um, I think the next time we're going to be having, we're going to be meeting together is for Christmas Eve service. So definitely join us then. Again, 6 p.m. on the 24th. Um, but again, have a great week. Be safe, be blessed, we love you, and we'll see you again soon. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.